Hello, and thank you for joining me today. Today I want to talk to you about tearing down the walls of unbelief. Yes, unbelief is something that is just so prevalent, it seems, in the church. And it shouldn't be, because we're called believers for a reason. We're supposed to believe. Believe every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word he has written for us. We have to believe it. We can't let doubt and unbelief creep in and it will try to because that's what the devil wants you to do is just to get your eyes off of God and your eyes on circumstances. No, we're not to be doubters. We're not to be people that let unbelief, you know, even get a crack in our lives. No, we have to tear down those walls of unbelief and every other wall that the devil has erected in our lives. No, we had to go forth to be those people who will not be shaken from this word. We know what God's word says and we act upon it in obedience because we know God's not a liar. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have to only please him by faith. It means we can't let doubt of any kind, you know, even creep into our lives. Because, like I said, it's doubt. Think about this. Doubt and unbelief, they're twins, all right? They're the same thing. They're basically saying that God's a liar, that his word ain't true. Well, we know that's not, you know, true. We know God is faithful to his word, and he cannot lie. So if there's any doubt or unbelief in your life, you need to get it out and start living and walking by faith. Start believing what God says and walk in obedience to it. In Hebrews 3, 7 through 15, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my work 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And then goes on to say in 18 and 19, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So he's going back to the old covenant and saying, you know, even in the old covenant, when God was trying to lead them to the promised land, to, to victory, it says they hardened their hearts. They just, you know, got off into murmuring, complaining, just, you know, and not believing that what he said would come to pass. That's why he said they couldn't enter in. Why? Because they didn't obey his word. They couldn't enter in because of unbelief. And so as he as the, um, they're bringing back what happened in the old covenant, now they're talking to, in verse 12, the believers, the brethren, you know, the church. He said, now beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you. Now in the New Covenant, he's telling us again, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So unbelief is evil. Like I said, it's a sin. It's the sin of unbelief because it's basically saying that God's a liar, that his word ain't true. And like I said, we know that ain't going to cut it because God is true to his word. God and his word, in fact, are one and the same. So we have to get unbelief out of us because it's evil. Like I said, it's contrary to the word of God. Doubt and unbelief, like I said, are twins and they're both against what the word says. And so if we want to enter in, in this side of the cross into the full measure of what God has for us, which for us as members of the body in the new covenant is the glorification and the rapture and that full measure of the, of the inheritance of eternity, then we have to make sure we don't have any unbelief. We have to tear down every wall of unbelief, every wall of doubt and move it out of our lives. Like I said, we're called believers for a reason. We're supposed to believe what God's word says and then we walk in obedience to it. Doesn't matter what we see with our natural eyes, hear with our natural ears. No, we don't go by that. We walk by faith and not by sight. In Matthew 17, 14 through 21. And when they had come to him, excuse me, when they had come to the multitudes, a man came to him, came to Jesus, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. And then Jesus, Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, 
because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So Jesus had to, you know, cast out this, you know, epileptic spirit, this demonic force that was, you know, causing this boy, you know, not to be able to move forward in life. You know, it threw him into the water, into the fire. It was, a, you know, this deaf and dumb spirit. So Jesus had to cast him out. Why? Because this man came to the disciples and they didn't know what to do. You know, by this time, they should have been understanding that they had the power and authority to cast out demons. They've been with Jesus. He's granted that authority. But so that's why he said, oh, faithless and perverse generations. Like, you know what? How long am I have to sh show you these things? I've given you the authority. You need to do this. So he had to take over. And he, of course, cast the demon out. So later they came to him. And it's like, why couldn't we cast it out? And the first thing he says, because of your unbelief. See, they, they, they didn't believe that they had that authority, even though they've been with Jesus. Well, we have to understand, no. He says, if you even have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could even say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will obey you. There's power in your words, but you have to believe. And then notice in verse 21, he says, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Well, a lot of people teach that that's talking about this kind of demon. This demon, you know, can't come out unless prayer and fasting. And that's, you know, that's a part of it. But I think there's a deeper measure of understanding that Jesus was trying to get into their, their thick skulls. That this kind of unbelief doesn't come out of us unless we are prayed up, unless we are spending time in God's presence and fasting. And, and true biblical fasting is not going on a hunger strike. Or it, and, it, and another thing I want to tell you is true fasting doesn't change God. It changes us. It helps us to put down the flesh to hear better clearly from God. But he basically tell me, you know what? You need to start listening to God. You need to start spending time in his presence. Spend time in his word. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. Praying in tongues. You know, aligning yourself with the word in prayer and fasting, all the disciplines of the kingdom. That's what he's trying to get to them. This kind, not just only the kind of demon, but this kind of unbelief won't come out of either of you or me unless we are built up in the word. But when we're built up in the word, guess what? We're not going to let anything shake us. We're not going to let a demon frighten us away. No, we have authority over that demon. We have authority over sickness and disease and lack and poverty and oppression over the devil himself. So no, we're not going to let unbelief cause us to back off. No, we're going to build ourselves upon this word and we're going to do what Jesus said. In fact, he said in John 14 that not only will you do the works that I do, but even greater ones. Why is that? Well, he sent us the Holy Spirit. We now have the Holy Spirit available to live on the inside of us to as God in us on the earth, empowering us to do the works of faith, the works of the kingdom. So no, we have to move unbelief out, move doubt out, all that, and start walking and living by faith, knowing that we know that we know, as we speak it forth, it will happen. In Matthew 13, 54 through 58, talking about Jesus, it says, And when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished, and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. See, it was because of their unbelief. See, Jesus is not limited in himself. But a person's unbelief, their free will limits him in the sense that he can't move like he wants to because of their unbelief. Like I said, God is not limited in himself. But people put limits on God because of their unbelief. You know, so they thought, you know what, they known him only as the carpenter's son. Because they known him in the natural realm. But they didn't know that he was the son of God. They didn't really understand that. They, they were hardened through unbelief. Well, there's many Christians today, even though they're truly born again, they, have, they, they don't see Jesus as the healer, the deliverer, the one who casts out demons. They don't see themselves in Christ as one who also can heal the sick and cast out demons and take authority. So that's why we have to get unbelief out. We can't be like these people and not, you know, see God move in our lives and, and to use us as his vessels if we have unbelief and doubt in us. Now, we have to get those things out. Like I said, they're walls that come up and cause us not to move forward. Until we break down those walls, tear them down with the authority of the power of the word, with the authority of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're not going to move forward. Unbelief will keep you standing still. When God's saying, you know what, 
go through the open doors that I have for you. But first, you have to get that unbelief out. Remember, it's an evil heart of unbelief, the sin of unbelief. We have to move it out if we want to get to the next level of victory in our lives. In Romans 4, in Romans 4, 19 through 25, it's talking about the faith of Abraham. And we need to look to Abraham, read throughout Genesis and other places, you know, because he, him and Sarah were promised in their old age. You know, he was 100, went on 100 and she was in her 90s. Well, in the natural realm, you know, that's laughable. It's like, we can't have a child at this age. But guess what? He stood upon what God said. And now we're going to see what it, when it talks about in the new covenant about the faith of Abraham. It says, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform and therefore was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So we need to, just like Abraham, believe that what God says will come to pass. It will. See, he didn't waver. Think about it. Through unbelief. One day up and the next day down. Like it says in James, a double minded man. Well, we know they're unstable in all their ways. The Bible says they won't ever receive anything. You can't have any. You can't be, okay, today I believe the next day. Well, I don't see it in five minutes, so I don't believe. No, we have to be like Abraham. See, he didn't go by his natural senses, what he could see, feel, touch, or hear. No, he went by faith. He said, you know what? doesn't matter how long I have to wait. I know that God said it, and I take it. See, we have to be consistent. And consistency lies the power. Consistent in believing and trusting God and knowing that faith is now. It says in Hebrews, now faith. I mean, faith is always in the now. In the natural one, we may not see it now in that natural sense, but we know it's there because what? We live by faith, not by sight. So it says we have to be like Abraham, fully convinced that what God promised, God is more than able to perform. Fully convinced, fully persuaded, and not let any doubt or unbelief come in. We have to know that Jesus is who he said he is, and he will deliver every time. You have to receive it right then, not wait until you see it. No, that's not how, how faith works. In fact, we're going to look at who is not in the Bible, he's called, usually called Doubting Thomas. Well, he had to see before he could believe. Well, we know that that's not, you know, they don't take any faith to believe something you can see. No, we have to be the supernatural people of God who believe before we see it, because we know that God's not a liar. In John 20, 24 through 29, now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came and the doors being shut and stood in the midst said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hands there and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So those are the ones who are blessed who have not seen me, but they believe because they know that when he said that I'm going to rise again, they believed it because they know who he is. See, Thomas had to see. He had to touch. He had to see with his natural eyes. He had to touch with his natural hands. And then he's like, oh, I believe. That's why, you know, Jesus said, oh, you've seen me. That's why you believe. But the ones who are going to share in the blessing are those who haven't seen, but they still believe. Like Abraham, they walk by faith, not by sight. They've torn down the walls of unbelief. They are, like I always say, they have received God's PhD, which means past having doubts. There's no doubt. There's no unbelief. They know that what God said will come to pass. Think about it. That's what we have to believe. We have to have our degree in faith, past having doubts. We know that God's word is true, and we're not going to let the sin of unbelief or doubt creep in because we're believers, not doubters. Think about it. In Mark 11, 22 through 24. So Jesus said to them, answered and said to them, have faith in God. That means have the God kind of faith. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. 
Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. That's the key. When you pray, not after you've seen them. Don't take faith for that. It says, once you pray, do you believe? It means you, you take it by faith. Faith sees the answer now. We know it's already done. You may not see it for five minutes. It could be five days, five weeks, five years. It doesn't matter. You are knows that God has already answered your prayer. Think about it. It says, even if you can say to a little mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. You have the power and authority. And you believe it will come to pass? It will. It doesn't matter if it's a little mountain or a figurative mountain. Whatever is your mountain, whatever is standing in your way of hindering you from the blessing, guess what? You need to move it out of the way. Well, first, you make, make sure you, there's no doubt or unbelief. It says, he who does not doubt in his heart. Means if there's doubt there, don't speak it because the devil will come for the negative words just as much as God will come for the positive ones. But once you've moved out in unbelief and you believe in your heart what you're speaking, then you, what you believe in your heart, you speak it out of your mouth and you know it's already done. It's a done deal. Think about it. That's the God kind of faith. The faith that believes in the heart and speaks with the mouth in accordance to this word and knows it's already done. See, that's what we have to understand as believers. Then if you read further in 25 and 26, it, make, it says make sure that you're have no unforgiveness because, of course, faith works by love. But once you put all those ingredients together, guess what? You can move mountains out of your life, the literal ones, the figurative ones, and you can move Satan out of your business. But first, you're going to have to get all that doubt and unbelief out of you because you're not supposed to be an unbeliever or a doubter. You're supposed to believe, be who God says you are, one who believes every word that proceeds out of his mouth. Every word. This Bible is written to you as your roadmap to, get, to go forth into victory. Because the next big event on God's timetable is the glorification and rapture of the church. Do you want to qualify as a true member of the body of Christ who's going to receive the full inheritance? Then you need to make sure that there's no doubt or no unbelief in your life at all. Like I said, be past having doubts and start walking and living by faith and knowing that what God says will come to pass. Believe him, trust in him and walk in obedience to him and move out doubt, move out unbelief, tear down those walls and don't ever let him come back up again. So get this in the forefront of your thinking and start walking every day and living, believing in God and his word and never let doubt or unbelief creep in. Amen. And thank you for watching.